the world as a whole has forgotten the real meaning of the word love. Love has been so abused and crucified by man that very few people know what true love is. Just as oil is present in every particle of the olive, so love permeates every part of creation. But to define love is very difficult, for the same reason that words cannot fully describe the flavor of an orange. You have to taste the fruit to know its flavor. So with love, How to Cultivate Divine Love Extracts from Lectures by Paramahansa Yogananda October 10th, 1943 All of you have tasted love in some form in your hearts. Therefore, you know a little about what it is but you have not understood how to develop love, how to purify and expand it into divine love. A spark of this divine love exists in most hearts in the beginning of life, but is usually lost because man does not know how to cultivate it. Many people wouldn't think it even necessary to analyze what love is. They recognize love as the feeling they have for their relatives, friends, and others whom they are strongly attracted. But there is much more to it than that. The only way I can describe real love to you is to tell you its effect. If you could feel even a particle of divine love, so great would be your joy, so overpowering you could not contain it. Think deeply about what I am telling you. The satisfaction of love is not in the feeling itself, but in the joy that feeling brings. Love gives joy. We love love because it gives us such intoxicating happiness. So love is not the ultimate. The ultimate is bliss. God is Sat Chit Ananda, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. We as soul are individualized Sat Chit Ananda. From joy we have come, in joy we live and have our being, and in that sacred joy we will one day melt again. All the divine emotions, love, compassion, courage, self-sacrifice, humility, would be meaningless without joy. Joy means exhilaration, an expression of the ultimate bliss. Man's experience of joy originates in the brain, in the subtle center of God consciousness that the yogis call the Sahasrar, or thousand-petaled lotus. Yet the actual feeling of joy is experienced not in the head, but in the heart. From the divine seat of God consciousness, in the brain, joy descends into the heart center and manifests there. That joy comes from God's bliss, the essential and ultimate attribute of spirit. Though joy may be born in conjunction with certain outer conditions, it is not subject to conditions, 
it often manifests without any material cause. Sometimes you wake up in the morning, walking on air, with joy, and you don't know why. And when you sit in the silence of deep meditation, joy bubbles up from within, roused by no outer stimulus. The joy of meditation is overwhelming. Those who have not gone into the silence of true meditation do not know what real joy is. We feel much happiness in the satisfaction of a desire. But in youth, we often feel in the heart a sudden happiness that comes as if from nowhere. Joy expresses itself under certain conditions, but it is not created by those conditions. Thus, when someone receives a thousand dollars and exclaims, Oh, how happy I am! The condition of having received a thousand dollars has merely served as a pickaxe, releasing a fountain of joy from the hidden reservoir of bliss within. So, in human experience, certain events are usually required to bring forth joy, but the joy itself is the perennial native state of the soul. Love also is native to the soul, but love is secondary to joy. There could be no love without joy. Can you think of love without joy? No. Joy attends love. When we speak of the misery of unrequited love, we are talking of an unfulfilled longing. The actual experience of love is always accompanied by joy. The Universal Nature of Love In the universal sense, love is the divine power of attraction in creation that harmonizes, unites, binds together. It is opposed by the force of repulsion, which is the outgoing cosmic energy that materializes creation from the cosmic consciousness of God. Repulsion keeps all forms in the manifested state through Maya. The power of delusion that divides, differentiates, and disharmonizes. The attractive force of love counteracts cosmic repulsion to harmonize all creation and ultimately draw it back to God. Those who live in tune with the attractive force of love achieve harmony with nature and their fellow beings and are attracted to blissful reunion with God. In this world, love presupposes duality. It springs from a mutual exchange or suggestion of feelings between two or more forms. Even animals express a certain type of love for one another and for their offspring. In many species, when one mate dies, the other usually succumbs soon after. But this love in animals is instinctive. They are not responsible for their love. Human beings, however, have a great deal of conscious self-determination in their exchange of love with others. In man, love expresses itself in various ways. We find love between man and wife, parent and child, brother and sister, friend and friend, master and servant, guru and disciple, as with Jesus and his disciples, and the great masters of India and their shalas, and between the devotee and God, soul and spirit.
Love is a universal emotion. Its expressions are distinguished by the nature of the thought through which it moves. Hence, when love passes through the heart of the Father, fatherly consciousness translates it into fatherly love. When it passes through the heart of the mother, motherly consciousness translates it into motherly love. When it passes through the heart of the lover, the consciousness of the lover gives that universal love still another quality. It is not the physical instrument, but the consciousness through which the love moves that determines the quality of love expressed. Thus a father may express motherly love, a mother may express friendly love, a lover may express divine love. Every reflection of love comes from the one cosmic love. But when expressed as human love, in its various forms, there is always some taint in it. The mother doesn't know why she loves the child. The child knows not why he loves the mother. They do not know whence comes this love they feel for one another. It is the manifestation in them of God's love, and when it is pure and unselfish, it reflects his divine love. Thus, by investigating human love, we can learn something of divine love. For in human love, we have glimpses of that love of God's. Fatherly love is based on reason. Fatherly love is wisdom born and based on reason. Uppermost in the father's consciousness is the thought, this is my child to take care of and protect. He does this unselfishly, expressing his love by doing things to please and instruct the child as well as providing for its needs. But fatherly love is partly instinctive, as are all forms of familial love. The father cannot help but love the child. Motherly love is based on feeling and is unconditional. Motherly love is broader. It is based on feeling rather than on reason. True mother love is unconditional. We can say that in many ways it is more spiritual and therefore greater than most human expressions of love. God implanted in the heart of the mother a love for the child that is unconditional. Regardless of the child's merit or behavior, even if the child in later life becomes a murderer the mother's love remains steady, unchanged, whereas the father may be more impatient and less inclined to forgive. The unconditional love of the mother is perhaps the human love closest to the perfection of God's love. The true mother forgives her son even when no one else will. That kind of love exemplifies God's love he forgives his children no matter what sins they have committed. Now who can have placed this love in the mother's heart, save God? In true maternal love, God gives us distinct proof that He loves us unconditionally, no matter how wicked we are or how many times we have sinned. The Divine Spirit is not a tyrant. He knows He has put us in a world of delusion. He knows we are in trouble. 
He knows of our struggles. Man only increases the inner darkness of his spiritual ignorance when he thinks of himself as a sinner. It is better for him to try to correct himself, appealing to the Divine Mother for help, beholding in her the reflection of God's infinite love and forgiveness. While I was meditating last night, I sang this song to the Divine. O oh, Divine Mother, I am thy little babe, thy helpless babe, secretly sitting on thy lap of immortality. I shall steal my way to heaven secreted on thy lap. In the shelter of thy lap, I shall steal my way to heaven. No karma can touch me, for I am thy babe, thy little babe, thy helpless babe. Secretly on thy lap, I shall steal my way to heaven. That is the relationship to have with God, for the love of the mother is the all-forgiving love of the divine. Conjugal love At its most idealistic, conjugal love can be one of the greatest expressions of human love. Jesus implied this when he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. When man and woman genuinely and purely love one another, there is complete harmony between them in body mind, and soul. When their love is expressed in the highest form, it results in a perfect unity. But this love, too, has its flaw. It can be tainted by the abuse of sex, which eclipses divine love. Nature has made the sex impulsive, very strong so that creation might go on. Therefore, Sex has its place in the marital relationship between man and woman. But if it becomes the supreme factor in that relationship, love flies out the door and disappears completely. In its place comes possessiveness over familiarity and the abuse and loss of friendship and understanding. Though sexual attraction is one of the conditions under which love is born. Sex in itself is not love. Sex and love are as far apart as the moon and the sun. It is only when the transmuting quality of true love is uppermost in the relationship that sex becomes a means of expressing love. Those who live too much on the sex plane lose their way and fail to find a satisfying marital relationship. It is by self-control in which sex is not the ruling emotion, but only incidental to love. That husband and wife can know what real love is. In this modern world, unfortunately, love is too often destroyed by overemphasis on sex experience. Those who practice a natural, not forced, moderation in their sex life develop other enduring qualities in the husband-wife relationship. Friendship, companionship, understanding, mutual love. For example, Madame Amelita Gali Curci and her husband, Homer Samuels, are the greatest lovers I have met in the West. Their love is beautiful because they practice these ideals of which I speak. When parted even for a short time, they eagerly look forward to seeing each other again, to being in each other's company, to sharing their thoughts and love. They live for each other. 
The relationship between Ella Wheeler Wilcox and her husband is another beautiful example of conjugal love. Mr. John Larkin, a student of mine who knew them, told me that he had never seen anything like their love. He said each time that they met, it was as if they experienced again the joy of the first time. They were utterly devoted to one another. For three years after his death, her constant thought was a reunion with him. Then she passed on, his name on her lips. I met a man of similarly unselfish devotion in this country. He deeply loved his wife, so much that his love for her became transmuted into divine love. After she died, he wandered for years, seeking a way to find her again. At last, he did succeed. In the end, he found God through his love for her. This is the story as he told it to me. In his wanderings after death, he sought out a great saint in the Himalayas. He persuaded the holy man to promise to give spiritual initiation to him and his wife together. After assuring him of his promise, the saint asked, Where is your wife? The husband then told him that she was dead. The saint nevertheless kept his promise to give initiation to the two together. He instructed the man to sit in meditation and began to invoke the presence of the wife. Suddenly, she appeared. For a long time, she talked with her husband. Then the two sat together and received initiation from the saint. Afterward, the Holy One blessed them, and the wife departed. From that moment, the husband realized that the beloved form he had known as his wife was in reality an individualized manifestation of the consciousness of God, as is every human being. The true meaning of divine love, which is behind and responsible for every ideal human relationship, was revealed to him. His was a unique and true experience. But conjugal love is tricky, and most people leave this world with an unsatisfied heart. They have not sought marital love in the right way. Attracted mostly by pleasing appearance, they look for their soulmate in a graveyard of beautiful, nicely dressed forms, unmindful that a devil may be housed within. I'm not condemning man and woman for responding to the God-created law of attraction, I'm condemning the perversion of that attraction through lustfulness. Every man who looks upon a woman as an object of lust and who abuses woman to satisfy his lust commits self-destruction. Continued sex abuse impairs the nervous system and affects the heart, eventually destroying peace and happiness. Mankind must realize that the basic nature of the soul is spiritual. For man and woman to look upon each other only as a means to satisfy lust is to court the destruction of happiness. Slowly, bit by bit, peace of mind will go. The abuse of sex is comparable to running a car without oil. The body cannot stand it. Each drop of vital essence lost is equivalent to the loss of eight drops of blood. But the important point to remember is to learn self-control. This comes with control and purification of the mind and is far superior to abstaining outwardly from sex when the mind is yet dwelling on it. Mere suppression can be harmful. Man and woman should look upon one another as reflections of the divine. I find it very sweet when my husband calls the wife mother, or when she calls him father. Every woman should look upon man as father. My attitude toward woman is as toward a mother. 
In my eyes, she is not merely a woman, but an expression of the Divine Mother. It is Divine Mother I behold speaking to me through a woman. Women should not strive to attract men with it. One should always look neat, and it is not wrong to make oneself attractive if it is done with good taste, but it is wrong to strive purposely to attract the opposite sex through sex appeal. Attraction between man and woman should come from the soul. Those who have sex control and do not flaunt themselves as sex symbols have a much better chance of attracting the right kind of mate. So many young girls have come to me and complained that the boys want sex first or they won't take them out. Sex experience is ruinous to youthful lives. In India, young people never touch or kiss until they are married. Love comes first. That must be the ideal. When two people feel an unconditional attraction for each other, and are ready to sacrifice for one another, they are truly in love. Then only are they ready for an intimate relationship in marriage. Mere possessiveness won't do. When one marriage partner tries to control the other, it shows a lack of real love. But when they express their love in continual thoughtfulness for the true happiness of the other, it becomes divine love. In such a relationship, we have a glimpse of the divine. Many wives come to me and say, My husband doesn't want me to become interested in spiritual matters. This is extremely selfish. If the wife is trying to make herself more spiritual, the husband should cooperate with her. He won't lose her. On the contrary, he will receive a part of her virtue. This same principle applies to a woman's attitude toward her husband. The greatest thing a husband or wife can wish for their spouse is spirituality. For soul unfoldment brings out the divine qualities of understanding, patience, thoughtfulness, love. But each should remember that the desire for spiritual growth cannot be forced on the other. Live, love yourself, and your goodness will inspire all your loved ones. After a few years of marriage, thousands of husbands and wives ask themselves, where has our love gone? It has been burned on the altar of sex abuse, selfishness, and lack of respect. When these qualities enter the relationship, love turns to ashes. Woman nags man when he strives to enslave her or when she feels he has neglected her. However, tongue lashing is one of the worst treatments one can inflict on another. It is said that a woman's three-inch tongue can kill a man six feet tall. When man and woman mistreat each other, they destroy forever their happiness together. Man should strive to see the God in woman and to help her realize her spiritual nature. He should make her feel that she is with him not merely to satisfy his sensual appetite, but as a companion whom he respects and regards as an expression of the divine, and woman should look upon man in the same way. Another wrong attitude is fear of the opposite sex, abnormal aversion. Like abnormal attraction is an unhealthy attitude. From my master Swami Sri Yukteswarji, I learned to regard woman not as an instrument created for the entrapment and moral destruction of man, but as a representative of the Divine Mother of the Universe. 
if and when man begins to look upon woman as a mother symbol, he will find in her a loving protection he has never seen before. Through God's grace, I have been able to change the consciousness of many men and women with this spiritual thought. Every man should look upon woman as a symbol of the mother of the universe, and every woman should look upon man as a symbol of the father of the universe. When those persons left my presence, they felt that the Divine Mother and Heavenly Father had spoken through me because I addressed them from that Divine Consciousness. I wonder if there would be any conjugal love at all, if there were no such thing as sex attraction. Ordinary persons would not have the capacity to feel such love, but those who are spiritually developed would, because they are not attracted on the basis of sex. Those who have cultivated their soul qualities know that sex has nothing to do with true love. If you develop the perfect love of your soul, you will begin to get a glimpse of the divine. Jesus Christ manifested that love, which is pure and grand and wonderful. This love found expression also in the lives of many great saints. Love between master and servant. The tie of love between master and servant is based on mutual benefit. The more money and kindness given by the master, the more the servant loves him. The greater the service rendered by the servant, the more warmly the master regards him. This can be a relationship of love. But its basic motivation is the security each gives to the other. Friendship, grandest relationship of human loves. The relationship that exists between friends is the grandest of human loves. Friendly love is pure because it is without compulsion. One freely chooses to love his friends. He is not bound by instinct. The love that manifests in friendship can exist between man and woman, woman and woman, man and man. But in the love of friendship, there is no sexual attraction. One must practice celibacy and absolutely forget sex if one wants to know divine love through friendship. Then friendship nurtures the cultivation of divine love. Such pure friendship has existed between saints and between others who truly love God. If you once know divine love, you will never part with it, for there is nothing else like it in the world, for there is nothing else like it in the whole universe. Love gives without expecting anything in return. I never think of anyone in terms of what he can do for me, and I never profess love to someone because he has done something for me. If I didn't actually feel love, I wouldn't pretend to give it, and since I feel it, I give it. I learned that sincerity from my master. There may be some who do not feel friendly toward me, but I am a friend to all, including my enemies, for in my heart I have no enemies. Love cannot be had for the asking. It comes only as a gift from the heart of another. Be certain of your feeling before you say to anyone, I love you. Once you give your love, it must be forever not because you want to be near that person, but because you want perfection for that soul. To wish for perfection for the loved one and to feel pure joy in thinking of that soul is divine love, and that is the love of true friendship. The 
the unconditional divine friendship of guru and disciple. The relationship between guru and disciple is the greatest expression of love and friendship. It is unconditional divine friendship based on a shared singular goal, the desire to love God above all else. The disciple bears his soul to the master and the master bears his heart to the disciple. There is nothing hidden between them. Even in other noble forms of friendship, there is sometimes diplomacy, but the friendship of guru-disciple relationship is taintless. I can think of no relationship in this world greater than that which I had with my master. The guru-disciple relationship is love in its supreme form. I once left his ashram thinking I could more successfully seek God in the Himalayas. I was mistaken, and I soon knew I had done wrong. Yet, when I came back, he treated me as if I had never left. His greetings was so casual, instead of rebuking me, he calmly remarked, let us see what we have to eat this morning. But master, I said, aren't you angry with me for leaving? Why should I be, he replied. I do not expect anything from others, so their actions cannot be in opposition to wishes of mine. I would not use you for my own ends. I am happily only in your own true happiness. When he said that, I fell at his feet and cried. For the first time, there is someone who truly loves me. If I had been looking after the business of my earthly father and had run away, father would have been very angry with me. When I had refused to accept a lucrative position offered to me, he wouldn't speak to me for seven days. He gave me the most sincere fatherly love, but still it was blind. He thought money would make me happy. Money would have been the grave of my happiness. Only later, after I had started my school at Ranchi, did my father, did father relent and say, I'm glad you didn't take that job. But look at my master's attitude. Even though I ran away from the ashram to seek God, his love for me remained unchanged. He didn't even rebuke me. Yet, at other times, he always told me clearly when I was wrong. He said, if my love can be bribed to compromise itself, then it is not love. If I have to alter my behavior toward you for fear of your reaction, then my feeling for you is not true love. I must be able to speak to you honestly. You can walk out anytime, but so long as you are with me, I will remind you for your own highest good when you are going wrong. I had never imagined anyone could be so interested in me. He loved me for myself. He wanted perfection for me. He wanted me to be supremely happy. That was his happiness. He wanted me to know God, to be with the Divine Mother for whom my heart longed. Was that not divine love he expressed? To wish constantly to guide me in the path of goodness and love? When that love is developed between the guru and disciple, the disciple has no desire to manipulate the master, nor does the master seek control of the disciple. Supreme reason and judgment govern their relationship. There is no love like this and I tasted of that love from my master. God's love sublimely manifest in Bhagavan Krishna. Lord Krishna expressed in his life 
pure love in its highest form. He has shown to the world that a love without any impurity can exist between man and woman. It is impossible to describe adequately his life for the general public because it was so unique and transcended mundane laws and standards. Someday, I hope to put in print the true significance of Krishna's life, for it has been much misunderstood and misinterpreted. His expression of divine love was unique in the world. Krishna had many women disciples, but one favorite, Radha. Each disciple said to herself, Krishna loves me more than anyone else. Still, because Krishna often talked of Radha, the others were envious of her. Noticing their jealousy, he wanted to teach them a lesson. So one day, Krishna feigned a terrible headache. The anxious disciples expressed their great concern over the master's distress. At last, Krishna said, the headache will go away if one of you will stand on my head and massage it with your feet. The horrified devotees exclaimed, We cannot do this. You are God, the Lord of the universe. It would be highest sacrilege to dare to desecrate your form by touching your sacred head with our feet. The master was pretending an increase of his pain when Radha came on the scene. She ran to her Lord saying, what can I do for you? Krishna made the same request of her that he had made of the other devotees. Radha immediately stood on his head. The master's pain disappeared and he fell asleep. The other disciples angrily dragged Radha away from the sleeping form. We will kill you, they threatened. But why? You dare to step on the head of the master? What of it? Radha protested. Did it not free him from his pain? For such a sacrilegious act, you will go to the lowest stratum of Hades. Oh, is that what you are worrying about? Radha smiled. I would gladly live there forever if it would make him happy for a second. Then they all bowed down to Radha. They understood why Krishna favored her. For Radha, alone had no thought for herself, but only for her Lord's comfort. Nevertheless, because she received much special attention, Radha became filled with pride. So one day, the Lord Krishna said to her, let us steal away together. He played on her vanity, making her think he wanted to be alone with her. She was feeling very happy and favored. They walked some distance, and Krishna wasn't at all inclined to stop for rest. Finally, the wary Radha suggested, Here is a nice place to sit for a while. Krishna looked disinterested and replied, Let us find a better spot. They walked and walked. At last, the exhausted Radha complained, I cannot walk any further. Krishna said, All right. Do you want me to carry you? This very much pleased Radha's vanity. But even as she sprang to his back, oh, Krishna was gone. She fell in a heap on the ground. Her pride shattered. On her knees, she humbly cried, My beloved Lord, I was wrong in wanting to possess and control you. Please forgive me. Krishna reappeared and blessed her. Radha had learned a great lesson that day. It was a grievous error to look upon the master as an ordinary man, to be ensnared and controlled by feminine wiles. She realized that the master was interested not in her form, but in her soul. The perfect love between soul and spirit. The greatest love you can experience is in communion with God in meditation. 
The love between the soul and spirit is the perfect love, the love you are all seeking. When you meditate, love grows. Millions of thrills pass through your heart. If you learn to control sex, attraction, and attachment to human beings, and if you strive to love all and to meditate more deeply, there will come into your life such love as you never dreamed possible. That is the love that Krishna gave and that Jesus Christ expressed for all of his disciples. It is the love Jesus had for Mary. Martha worked hard for the Master, but her mind was on the chores, not on him. Mary thought more of the Master himself than of her work. Because of Mary's greater love, Jesus said of her, Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And on another occasion, when Mary had brought ointment to anoint the feet of Jesus, and Judas said, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? Christ answered, The poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. He accepted Mary's devotion not for himself personally, but for the spirit within him. And Mary, by anointing Jesus' feet, was expressing her love for God. Mary thought first to offer her love to him, who is master of the universe, and then to others, shows her good judgment. There is no one to whom we owe love more than to God, and there is no love sweeter than the love He gives to those who seek Him. So why spend all of your time pursuing temporary human love, conjugal, familial, fraternal, all forms of human love have blind alleys. Divine love is the only perfect love. It is God who is playing hide and seek in the corridors of hearts, that perchance behind lesser human loves, you may find his all-satisfying love. Therefore, love God, not for his gifts, but because he is your own, and because he made you in his image, and you will find him. If you meditate deeply, a love will come over you such as no human tongue can describe. You will know his divine love, and you will be able to give that pure love to others. That divine love of God came over me last night. I had only a wink of sleep, so overwhelming it was. In that great flame of love I am beholding you all. Such is the love I feel for you. In your faces I see what is in your hearts. In the consciousness of one who is immersed in the divine love of God, there is no deception, no narrowness of caste or creed, no boundaries of any kind. When you experience that divine love, you will see no difference between flower and beast, between one human being and another. You will commune with all nature, and you will love equally all mankind. Beholding but one race, the children of God, your brothers and sisters in him, you will say to yourself, God is my father. I am part of his vast family of human beings. I love them, for they are all mine. I love too, my brother, son, and my sister, Moon, and all creatures my father has created and in whom his life flows. True love is divine, and divine love is joy. The more you meditate seeking God with a burning desire, the more you will feel that love in your heart. Then you will know that love is joy, and joy is God.
excerpts from the book The Divine Romance by Paramahansa Yogananda. <laughs> 